Coming up right now, the newest episode from Carr, Gwyn, and Ode on Three Pagans and a Cat. Some things have to be believed to be seen. Welcome to Theism and Non-Theism, Beliefs in the Divine, the 45th episode of Three Pagans and a Cat. Our opening today is courtesy of 20th century author Madeline Lengel. You may call me Ode. You can call me Carr. I'm Ode's father. Mary Meat. My name is Gwyn, Ode's mother. And I'm so glad you picked Madeline Lengel. I figured I you would like that oh, one, yeah. Oh, God. What a great writer. <laughs> Absolutely love if that. If you're unaware, Madeline Lengel wrote A Wrinkle in Time mm. and its subsequent books. Yes. Yes. Among yeah. other wonderful mm-hmm. works yep. that yes. she has provided the world. I think A Wrinkle in Time is her, That's her, big, her most, her yeah. big, her most yeah. famous Yeah, yeah. That's the most famous Newberry winner, that kind yep. of thing. Mm-hmm. So we're going to start with our housekeeping. We have new patrons, first of all. Yes, we do. Uh, we have one new patron, yes. Our new patron is Misha Lutz. Welcome, Welcome Misha Lutz. There you go. Thank you for for supporting Three Mm -hmm. Pagans and a Cat. We appreciate it. Do we have any other major housekeeping stuff? The Michigan Pagan Fest is coming up in about a month. Right. We're going to be there. Why don't we give the dates for that? It's June 20th through the 23rd. And it's (laughs) Witchy Wonders of the World is the theme this year. Lots of great speakers, lots of great workshops Mm -hmm. going on. Lots and lots of vendors, if last year was true. (laughs) The last time I looked, they only had two spaces left in the in the vendor barn. Wow. So it's gonna filling up, yeah. It's gonna be busy. Yep, gonna be busy. And there won't be any readers or Reiki or anything in that area this year. They're gonna be somewhere else. Which is so so nice because it was it was kind of chaotic when you wanted to get a reading from somebody with all the everything going on. It it got a little hard. So they're separating those out this year, so that's it's going to be that nice. That's going to be nice. Which means more vendors. That's right. right. Yep. And then we're not going to be teaching classes at Michigan Pagan Fest, yep. but nope. we are going to be broadcasting live. On throughout our YouTube the, channel. Yep, on our YouTube channel throughout the event. That's right. So you find us on YouTube and subscribe now so that when we hit that, it automatically pings you and lets you know that we're live and going. Theoretically. So I'm on YouTube <laughs> a lot. The subscriptions don't always do anything. Hit the notification bell. There's right. there's a, yeah. a a chance then that you'll get an update, <laughs> an alert that something is happening. There's still a chance that you won't. So just at just the end check. of June, just check the channel. Just just keep checking the the week of the twentieth <laughs> through the twenty third. We will be on. We'll, we'll be live. We pretty will be extensively. live pretty extensively throughout that event. Mm-hmm. Yep. And I will make sure that I hang out on the Discord mm-hmm, mm-hmm. as well uh, on Facebook. But but you can answer questions. Yeah, right. And yep. things, so, so people kind of exactly you better interact. get a hold of us, and I'll make sure I put out little announcements saying yeah who's coming up yep. and that kind of stuff because we'll be interviewing people live and a thousand percent sure Bill L. Yeah, probably. Yeah, yeah, we'll probably get Bill sit down and talk to me and. And Ooh. I know Pat and Paul are coming over to talk yeah. to me. And, yeah, That's so. right. And Pagans in Need, I believe, is... Uh, yeah, PIN is the official nonprofit, I believe. Right. Yes. That's, uh, receiving a, yeah. that's receiving donations, money, yeah. money yep. from Michigan Pagan Fest. Yep. yep. That is correct. Which is mm-hmm. cool, because they're a great, uh, a great charity, oh, a great a wonderful charity. resource. Mm-hmm. Yep. Absolutely. For the community. Yep. Uh, so I think that's it for housekeeping stuff. I think so. That's pretty much it. All right. Now I guess we get into the meat of this particular episode. Sure. Mm-hmm. This is kind of going to be a like a primer. It's not officially a first steps episode, Mm-mm. but it's sort of the first part of a pair of episodes that we're doing. And then there's going to be two more pairs of episodes that we're doing for a total of six episodes. Uh, we're going to be discussing in this episode, Beliefs in the Divine. It's going to be followed up by an episode about working with the divine, mm-hmm. working with deities. Yep. Then we're going to do an episode about beliefs in spirits, and Mm -hmm. then another episode about working with spirits, and then we're going to do an episode about beliefs in ancestors in the afterlife and working with ancestors. I do think we should note that there will be some episodes in between those Yeah, it's not going to be, you know, right right in a row, but you can look forward to these coming up uh, for the rest of the year, kind of, let's Mm -hmm. say. Right. That I just want to give, you know, yeah. a, th- this isn't officially part of the First Steps right. program. Yeah. These are just a, a short series of semi-connected episodes, let's say, Correct. that are coming up. We're going to start here with theism and non-theism, where we're going to cover some high-level concepts talking about what sort of beliefs in the divine there are, how mm-hmm. they're sort of formalized and systemized. And then I also want to talk a little bit about sort of what makes something divine as opposed to just a spirit or a, a venerated ancestor or that kind of thing. So sure. we're going we're gonna to discuss all of that. Yep. And then also, of course, those people who don't believe. Right, yes, in, non-theism. Yeah, non-theism. Yeah, we're going to discuss all this. We're going to try to keep the tone of this conversation 
light. It's going to be a little bit academic to a certain extent, and then we're going to... Certainly when Ode is talking. We're certainly when I'm talking, it's going to be a little academic. And then we're going to discuss sort of our personal feelings mm-hmm. on these kind of things and our personal, you know, progress and how we've moved through our personal understandings of beliefs in the divine mm-hmm. and non-belief in the divine. That's right. Because all, all three of us have gone through various stages of that. That's right. And true. we'll probably go through more stages in the future. Yep. Mm-hmm. But because these are topics that can be really contentious and sort of difficult to grapple with, we're going to mm-hmm. try to keep this tone a little lighter and try not to get into too many arguments. But we'll see how that goes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we're going to argue. It's, 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 it's. Okay. Well, I don't see any arguments coming out of it, but you never know. Quit arguing with me about it. <laughs> First, we're going to start with some basic definitions, because I think part of the difficulty of discussing, you know, what be- your beliefs in the divine are, are getting everybody to be using the same vocabulary. Which is a post that I just put on sort of. the Agora, was talking about, you know, terms and how we define these terms so that people can be on the same page. Right, sort of. You were talking about it. Uh, a slightly different set of vocabulary than we're talking about here, but it's a similar problem. Mm -hmm. First, we're just going to cover theism and non-theism. Then we're going to dig down into sort of the different subsets of those groups, right? Because theism and non-theism are two sort of umbrella terms. Right. So theism is a belief in the existence of divine powers. Mm -hmm. Non-theism is a lack of belief in the existence of divine powers. Mm -hmm. And that's all either of them are. Mm -hmm. To get any more concrete than that, you have to drill down into the various subgroups. Mm -hmm. So under the umbrella of theism, we have monotheism, which is the belief that only one deity exists. Mm -hmm. We have henotheism, which is the belief that many gods exist, but only one god is worshipped by an individual. We have monolatrism, which is the belief that many gods exist, but only one god is worth worshipping, mm-hmm. which is different from henotheism, where uh, all the gods may be worthy of worship, but mm-hmm. you only happen to worship one because only this god is relevant to your interests. Right. We have polytheism, which is the belief that multiple gods exist and are all worshipped. Mm-hmm. Polytheism has two of its own subsets, Hard polytheism, which is the belief that multiple gods are distinct and separate beings. And soft polytheism, which is the belief that multiple gods are sublimations of a single divine being. So they're like uh, faces. Yes. Faces. Facets. Of one, faces or facets of one divine being. Uh-huh. We have pantheism, which is the belief that the physical universe is God. Mm-hmm. We have panentheism which is the belief that the divine interpenetrates the universe and also transcends space and time. Mm -hmm. We have deism, which is the belief that one God created the universe and then completely stopped interacting with it. And we have autotheism, which is the belief that the self is God or can become God. Mm -hmm. Now, this is not an exhaustive list, but these are sort of the major... The ones that most people will understand. Right. These are the major theistic systems. Right. Mm -hmm. And I was sitting here going, which one of those would I classify Uh myself as? (laughs) I would classify myself as a polytheist, panentheist believer. Interesting. Okay. Carr, how how would you classify yourself? Uh, probably hard polytheism. Yeah, that's yep. that's where I am too. Mm-hmm. I'm a I'm a hard polytheist. I think, uh, and I by and large, yeah. And I I have um I know in the past as a witch I was probably what you would call a soft polytheist. Mm-hmm. I I believed, and I think a lot of Wiccans fall into that uh-huh. uh, idea of there's one where they worship archetypes. Yeah, they worship archetypes, which is where the various uh, pantheons come mm-hmm. from. But there's ultimately one spiritual force, you know, or being right. that is the Lord and Lady. Right. Archetypes. Archetypes, yeah. Mm -hmm. But I could be wrong because it's been a long time since I was a Wiccan. (laughs) It varies. It varies. And it it does vary by tradition Mm -hmm. because some of them are very monotheist. Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. Or henotheist. Or henotheist. Or monolatrist. Mm -hmm. There's just a lot of variation. A uh, lot of ifs. A lot of, well, yes. Um, (laughs) But there's a lot of variation between even groups in the same Mm -hmm. religion. Yeah, yeah. A specific theistic belief doesn't necessarily differentiate to religions, it mm-hmm. may differentiate two sects in one religion. Right. Well, I mean, even within Christianity, you've got yeah. poly, not polytheists. Some people th- think they're polytheists. <laughs> you got monotheists, but you also have deists. 
Yep. You know, that's what a lot of... A lot of, of our the, founding our fathers founding in America fathers, were deists. Yep. They, can, you know, they, they come under the Christian umbrella, but they did have that belief that God created everything and then and stepped, then stepped back. back. Yep. And never interacted with it again. Mm-hmm. Yep. Mm-hmm. So that's why you have people arguing, you know, that it's a Christian nation. And it is. It's not really. But no. not. It's not at all. To some so, people. So, so here's, here's a question for you. Just to throw something out. Okay. And we've talked about Christianity a lot, and I've never really thought about this. So the Trinity. Yes. Mm-hmm. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Yes. Right. There's actually... All one God, but... Three facets. Three, three facets. facets. Yeah. Yeah. Percent, yeah. Right. So there are academic discussions about this. Right. Um, the, kind of figured there would be. There is uh, a school of thought that modern-day Christianity, as a monotheistic tradition, Mm -hmm. grew out of a monolatrist tradition that grew out of a soft polytheist tradition. Mm -hmm. So explain monolatrist again. Monolatrism is the belief that although many gods may exist, only one of them is worthy of worship. Now that makes sense, because when you think about what God said in the the Old Testament, no other god shall be held above me. No other gods shall be before me. So he is stating that there are other gods. He references their existence, but that he is supreme. Right. That would be monolatrist, Mm -hmm. rather than monotheist. Which makes sense when you take into account that was Abraham was actually a person who had multiple gods mm-hmm. that he was you know in his, in his uh, worship worship and ultimately went to one god right out of that pantheon right yep. which you know shades into henotheism mm-hmm. again yep but the difference between monolatry and henotheism mm-hmm. is that Henotheism acknowledges that all of these gods are worthy of worship. Right. You just only happen to be worshiping one, mm-hmm. and you may worship only one at this time and worship others at different times, whereas monolatry is the belief that only one out of many gods is worthy, worthy. of worship. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Interesting. You could see how someone might even start from a henotheistic perspective mm-hmm. and move towards a monolatrist perspective. Right, right. Lots of big words in this episode. <laughs> <laughs> What the Wikipedia theism and non-theism links are for. Mm -hmm. So if if you're having problems following along, (laughs) go to Wikipedia theism and Wikipedia non-theism and you'll see some of this stuff. Would it help if I spelled them? (laughs) No, they're all on here. Okay. They're all on there. I'm actually on the articles. Perfect. So, yeah. So now we're going to discuss briefly non-theism. We're going to discuss the systems under that umbrella. Mm Mm-hmm. So, first you have agnosticism, which Mm -hmm. is the belief that the divine is unknowable. Mm -hmm. You have hard agnosticism, which is the belief that the divine is unknowable and cannot be known. Mm -hmm. And soft agnosticism, which is the belief that the divine is unknowable now, but might be known in the future. Mm -hmm. You have agnosticism, which is the belief that the truth of divinity cannot be ascertained due to the ambiguity of the definition of gods. Mm -hmm. So the stance of agnosticism is essentially that this conversation can't happen until we come to a different consensus. Mm -hmm. There's atheism, which is that there is no divine. Right. And there is hard or explicit atheism, which asserts the absence of any divinity. Mm -hmm. And soft or implicit atheism, atheism, which asserts the absence of this person's personal belief in divinity. Mm -hmm. So the difference between an explicit and an implicit atheist is that an implicit atheist says, I don't believe there is a God, Mm -hmm. whereas an explicit atheist says, there is no God. Right. Got one more, which is yetzism, or spiritual but not religious, Mm. which is the belief that there is something divine or otherwise non-mundane that exists, but is unspecified. That's how I used to to be there for a while, Mm -hmm. with spiritual but not religious. Yep. The reason I brought up the blog post that I wrote Mm -hmm. um, for the Agora just this last... Recently, I had a comment from a gentleman who is an atheist, Mm -hmm. um, but he had difficulty defining the terms for other people. He actually no longer uses the term because he had a difficult time explaining to other people what he meant, what his position, what his was. position was. And I think it comes down to when people think of atheists, they really only have the definition for one. They think, they think of the, hard. They, th- they think of the explicit yeah, atheist. They think of the explicit atheist and because, they don't realize there are subtle levels in there. Well, I, I think uh, what comes to mind is an explicit atheist because explicit atheists 
are the people who have blogs yeah, they're the and loudest. write articles mm -hmm. and have YouTube channels. You know, they right. have they go about attempting to disprove the right. existence of gods, right. right? Whereas implicit atheists are comfortable just saying, I don't believe in this. Mm -hmm. And then they have nothing more to say on the subject. Right. And actually, within your terminology of, mm -hmm. of different types of atheism, I heard several of the words that he used to attempt to explain mm -hmm. what his own belief is. And now he says, I just don't even bother anymore. He has different words that he uses to try to help people understand what mm -hmm. his position is. But I just, I really do think it's because people only have an understanding of you're either an atheist, a hard atheist, or you're an agnostic. They don't realize there's that levels, there's, yeah. there's well, levels and in there's, between. And that there's even, you know, different degrees of agnosticism. Yeah. There yeah. are agnostics whose position is, I don't know if there's a God and you don't either. Right. And there are agnostics whose position is, I don't know that there's a God and I don't care if you do. Right. <laughs> Did you know that there are non-theistic Quakers? I did not. Tell I me about non-theistic Quakers. So non-theistic Quakers believe they practice all the same stuff that other Quakers do. Mm -hmm. Which is um, generally a Christian But they do not sex. accept a belief in a theistic understanding of God as a supreme being, a divine being, divine uh, soul or supernatural. Mm -hmm. Interesting. <laughs> See, that's the that's the thing that's so interesting. So they're interested in like realizing centered peace, simplicity, integrity, mm -hmm. community. Right. But All purely from a humanist perspective. From a humanist yeah, our perspective. humanist perspective. That's the interesting okay. thing is that, you know, Christianity likes to uh, present itself as a strictly monotheistic religion that doesn't have these potential sects with various layers, but they do. Well, a non-theistic Quaker wouldn't be a Christian. True. But I'm, I'm just thinking in the general sense, I guess, that, you know, because it's... Well, it's important to maintain the integrity uh, as a major world religion to mm -hmm. have one sort of overarching premise mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. to hold that premise very True. firmly and present that to outsiders as being a very clear mm -hmm. premise of your religion. That's how it's presented to outsiders. What happens inside is entirely separate. True. That's a good point. That's a good point. Where does Jediism fall? <laughs> <laughs> you laugh. No, I know. I understand. Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, and there are people actually, uh, so Lovecraft created the Cthulhu mythos. Yep. There are people today who uh, who genuinely, authentically uh, worship or work with Cthulhu or with uh, the other terrors. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and that sort of shit starts to shade into a little bit like what makes a god a god, which we'll get into in more depth a little later. But I would say that the, so Jediism is probably a panentheist uh, religious perspective essentially okay uh, that belief in the divine interpenetrating that's most like what the force is most similar to I would say yeah and then Cthulians would be some shade of polytheist mm -hmm. gotcha gotcha it's time for Gwen's God and Gems okay we can do that because in the last few weeks, I've been doing a lot of wild crafting in my yard. Mm -hmm, in the backyard. In the backyard, which is awesome. If you can wild craft your backyard, I encourage you to do it. I'm going to be talking about common chickweed today. Latin name is Stellaria media. It is native to Europe, um, but it has become established in the United States to the point where you can pretty much find chickweed in most lawns and areas that have either full or partial sun with good soil because once they get established somewhere they're very very stubborn the thing is it's also a very useful weed if you will <laughs> but it does in areas like the southern appalachians chickweed does appear in the fall or autumn and um, it dies back in late spring and early summer but then there are areas like michigan where it is an early spring plant, which is why we have it in mm -hmm. our yard right now. It thrives in temperatures between 53 degrees and 68 degrees. So depending on the area of the country you're in, right. that's when your chickweed will most likely blossom or bloom. Gotcha. Um, it can grow up to about a foot and a half, and it produces tiny little white flowers. There are some lookalikes, so if you are looking at, for chickweed in your yard, chickweed does not have a milky sap. So if you bend or break the you know the stem and it has a milky sap, that's that not, is chickweed. not chickweed. It also has a line of hair along the stem and alternates uh, between joints. And then the inner stem is elastic, so if you pull the stem apart 
and the outer sheath will separate, the inner part should uh, be elastic and bendable. Mm. Chickweed can be eaten raw, like sprouts in a sandwich or on, in a salad. It can also You can eat the stems, the leaves, the flowers, and the seed pods. Medicinally, it's used as a pain reliever, digestive support, skin treatment, kidney support, and you can use it as an astringent. And then for magical uses, it is a powerhouse. I mean, it can be used to maintain and strengthen relationships, to encourage fidelity, to attract love if you do not have a love relationship. It brings balance. It can provide endurance and persistence when you are going after uh, a particular job or a, you know have a particular project. It offers protection and strength. It's excellent for lunar magic and women's cycles. You can use it for travel because it has been pretty much all over the world. So it's wonderful for travel magic. It's also good for fertility and abundance, luck, healing, and some animal and bird magic. It's a very versatile plant. And because it does come up in pretty much everybody's yard at some point, <laughs> unless you put weed killer out there. It's very accessible. It's very accessible. And I, if, if you are in an area where, you know, it's moderate right now, you're, you know, it's in spring and um, the chickweed is growing, I encourage you to harvest it and give it a try because I think you'll be pleased. That's it for Gwen's Garden Gems. Now, Lorelai makes an interesting comment that I was thinking about a, a few minutes ago as well, about the fact that pagan, whether you want to call it pagan, occult, alternative religious community, mm -hmm. the community that we are all a part of, right? you know, it is so wildly divergent, mm -hmm. you know. Very it, diverse. It's very diverse. And, and uh, she makes that point that we are. And my thought was, it's amazing to me when you think of how wildly diverse we are, and yet we still argue amongst ourselves of what is what is legitimate within our own community as far as polytheists, panentheists, the types what, of beliefs and traditions, that kind of thing. Here's what I would say. The only time it's relevant for you to discuss the authenticity or validity of a spiritual system mm -hmm. is within your very specific spiritual community, not within the larger umbrella mm -hmm. community, because within the umbrella community, we have all these various layers. Yes, right. we do. It's only relevant to discuss which spiritual system is applicable to your tradition, not which spiritual systems are generally authentic. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. Yeah. That's right. And I mean, when, when you think about it, I mean, Wicca is one religion, I suppose. Um, right, yes. But yep. it's got so many traditions within that. Dianic um, Wiccans, for example, exactly. are kinotheistic or monolatrist. Exactly. And then you've got Gardnerian and you've got mm -hmm. Alexandrian, and they're right. all a little bit different. And then you've got the eclectic Wiccans, mm -hmm. who are picking a little bit from everybody. Who tend to be soft polytheists, mm -hmm. I find. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of eclectics are, yeah, are soft polytheists mm -hmm. who believe like, I can pick and choose from any pantheon because they all come from the same source. Exactly. I know for me, because when I first uh, started with Wicca back in the day, 20 years ago or almost mm -hmm. 20 years ago, I was just coming, I was coming out of Christianity mm -hmm. and I was used to a monotheistic religion system. system, but I was also used to the idea of having one God with three persons or aspects. Right. So it made sense to me. That so like go, everything might, all, all these individuals all these might individuals, come out of one, one overbeing, overbeing, one divine being mm -hmm. that had many different facets, both a male and female. Mm -hmm. So um, it's interesting. So that me. was comfortable. Soft polytheism was comfortable. was comfortable to you mm -hmm. as a more moderated divergence from the quote unquote monotheism mm -hmm. of Christianity. And I also of think, a Trinity inspired yes. Christianity. And I know that there's some, you know, there's a lot of argument out there is there any such thing as christian witchcraft that kind mm -hmm. of thing i think that's where christian witchcraft where people at least because i for a short time was a christian right. witch i do think it comes from this idea of soft polytheism i think it come i think christian witches come from the fact that witchcraft does not have an attached religious system well that's true so you can mm -hmm. sew it on to any religious system that's exactly true mm -hmm. okay so maybe i should amend that to the Christo Wiccans, because they're yes, and Christo, Christo pagans, Christo, Christo pagans, Christo pagans, yeah, who I assume are henotheists or monolatrists. Mm -hmm. And I don't think large. you hear about 
Crystal Pagans as much as you do Christian witches these no, days. No, you don't. But it was. Uh, it was a thing. It was and a it thing. is still a thing. And it's still, still a thing. thing. Yep. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah. And think, that in is fact, the... I think we have some in the Pride. Yes, yeah. we do. Uh, yeah. Some some Christo Pagans. We do. And, uh, but I do think that is true about witchcraft is that it is, at least in my view, not in everybody's view, but in my view, it is a practice. And you can be a Christian witch or a Buddhist witch or a, you know, what? A Vedic yeah. witch. Yeah. Vedic witch or a satanic witch. A heathen witch. Heathen yeah. witch. Whatever. Whatever you want to be. <laughs> yeah. Witchcraft you know. is a system for performing supernatural actions. Mm -hmm. It is... It is not a religion in and of itself. Right. It, it can exactly. be attached to religion. It can be attached to a yep. religion. Yep, absolutely. Do we want to pick up any of the other, like, bigger non-theistic religions, like Levianism? Well, I don't know say. enough about... Or Church of Satan. So the Church of Satan is interesting. We, we should talk, I guess, about secularism. Well, that's right. true. Which is distinct, in some ways, from non-theism. That is very true. Non-theism is the lack of a belief in the divine mm -hmm. of, of, of various kinds, right? Secularism is almost unconcerned with beliefs in the divine mm -hmm. about the truth or authenticity thereof mm -hmm. and is concerned solely with the functions of the material world. That's true. Although, if I'm remembering correctly, LaVey was more of a humanist yes. than a secularist. LaVey was a humanist, and I would argue that LaVey, I think, was an autotheist. Mm -hmm. So was Crowley, probably. Because autotheism, again, is the belief that the self is God right. or right. can right. apotheosize and become God. Right. So I think that's where the original Church of Satan that LaVey right. started. That came from an auto a an humanist auto and an autotheistic mm -hmm. place. Right. Now you've got different the modern got church of set, you've yes. got modern The the modern Satanist church of Satan, I believe, is secular. Yes, mm -hmm. completely. Completely mm -hmm. secular. Yep. Does not support the existence of any divine powers. No, it's all symbolism. Right. It's yep. all symbolic. Mm -hmm. And it's explicitly anti Christian, which yes. is why they use the Satan symbolic. Right. Mm -hmm. Yep. And Baphomet and that kind yes. of stuff. Yep. And then you do have you do your... have uh, Luciferians. Yes, Luciferians. Who... Uh, sometimes also called Satanists. Mm -hmm. yep. Who believe in divine powers and who worship. Lucifer, sometimes mm -hmm. to the exclusion of all other gods, which is another kind of henotheism or monolatry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Exactly. And then you've got other, yeah, obviously you've got other religions. Right, other major religions. Other major religions. Hindu. Hindu. Right. Which, uh, Hindu is interesting because in, depending on which sort of sect of Hinduism you're part of. Yeah, you can fall into multiple. Yeah, hin mm -hmm. Hinduism may be hard polytheist, it may be soft polytheist, it may be panentheist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It can uh, even be atheist. It can even be atheist, yeah. yeah. Hindu is mm -hmm. a very diverse religious system yeah. uh, in, just in and of itself. I'm going to take us back around to Satanism because okay. Rana, I think it was, asked, but Satan is a Christian dude, isn't he? And for LaVey, if I remember correctly, he created the Church of Satan almost, as, you know, with all the imagery as a antithesis to Christianity, mm -hmm. yep. a response mm -hmm. yeah. to Christianity because he was a humanist and an autotheist. Now, I'm not going to get into too much detail here on Satan as, no. as an individual. Mm -mm. We're planning to do an episode sometime in the future on dark gods and dark goddesses, and that will be the time sure. probably when yep. we'll discuss <clears throat> Satan as an individual in more detail. Mm -hmm. I will say that the modern concept of Satan versus the modern concept of Lucifer versus the ancient concept of Ha-Satan versus the ancient concept of the adversary, mm -hmm. there are several layers mm -hmm. to this individual Possibly they are not even one individual. So mm -hmm. we're not going to get into that in detail right now, but I will say that because the modern concept of Satan comes down through modern Christianity, right. I would say that people who today worship Satan are pulling from that well, yes. Yes. let's say. Yes, they are pulling from that. And some of them are doing it, as LeVay did, right. in a response. Uh, as a response to Christianity. And mm -hmm. some people just have authentic relationships That's with right. this individual. That's right. right. Yeah. There's a lot of history a lot to of this history individual. In layers. Yeah, um, there really is. Which we don't have time to get into no. here. But expect something to come in the future, because I actually find Satan it's very interesting. Yeah, it's it's really fascinating to, to uncover his history. Mm -hmm. It's time for Reviews. Nah. No. Really? Yeah. Yep. That's it for reviews. <laughs> <laughs> we uh we did not plan a review. Nope, we forgot. This this time. So there will not be one. 
goodness. But I know everybody really wanted the song. Uh huh. So. <laughs> so there you go. A nice yeah. isolated. <sighs> oh my goodness. Okay. Uh, review song. That's yep. right. <laughs> <laughs> I do want to, I think, talk a little more about the reality of systems versus religions Mm -hmm. and how traditions might be one or the other or might blend them. Right. Right? Mm -hmm. So, like, if you are inducted into a Wiccan coven, Mm -hmm. that coven may only practice a magical tradition. Mm -hmm. It may only practice a religious system. Or it may combine those two inextricably. And there is almost no way to know until you get into it. That's right. Because I think that's important to point out, Mm -hmm. definitely, is that there are some traditions within Wicca that really don't have magic as a part of their belief structure. It's purely ritual. It's It's purely purely religious. religious And and then you also will have some Wiccan traditions that are purely, Purely uh, purely magical with some or... No, or no, yeah, no uh, religious component component at all. I think that's true uh, across, uh, like not just in Wicca. I think that's true sort of across the umbrella community. Let's say, mm-hmm. Car is a druid who doesn't do magic. That's right, Correct. and I don't. I know that you've said that within the druid community, there are people who do practice magic. Yep. There are people who do not, and it's yep. not all Celtic. It's they they can there's right. various pantheons. Yeah, 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 yeah. Different uh, anything at least in the ADF. It's anything that stems from the um, Indo-European, European yeah, the Proto-Indo-European, yeah, yeah. So mm-hmm. the Pi, which gives you everything from like Turkey Vedic, to, mm-hmm. yeah. to the Celts. So yep. I mean, mm-hmm. kind of are the Irish. I'll right. put it yeah. that way. Yep. <laughs> um, so, you know, a huge... Huge range. Yeah, right. range. Because I think people tend to think of the Druids as strictly Irish, Celtic, mm-hmm. Scottish, Gaelic, that kind of Maybe thing. Manx. <laughs> Maybe Manx. Maybe yeah. Manx. But it's a much broader range, or at least modern. Yeah, yeah, things. I think... Yes, yeah, definitely in the, the broad ADF, ADF OBAD, Druid all system, that kind yeah. of stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it tends to be like, you know, you can kind of pick your pantheon mm-hmm. that's from that same or have language no pantheon, group. Pantheon, so, yeah, right? I'm curious. Right. Is yeah. it possible to be a Druid in the ADF and not have a pantheon? Is it possible to be a non-religious Druid in the ADF? Yes. It is. Okay. Yes, yep. Yeah, you yes, don't have to pick one. Isn't it the land, sea, and sky? Well, land, sea, and sky is is particularly a Celtic thing, mm-hmm. and a lot of ADF stuff is based on Celtic because that's what the founder was into. Right. Mm-hmm. But he was also into a bunch of other stuff, yeah. so it, it's a mismatch <laughs> of well, and, like um, most of our systems are these days, right? Yep. And traditionally, the ancient druids were Celtic, correct? Or uh, they think- a, a little bit of everything. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I think that, that there were definitely Celtic Druids. There were definitely Scottish Druids. There were definitely uh, Druids in Britain. Mm-hmm. Um, there were Druids in Brittany, which is part yeah, of France. Yeah, which is France now. Um, they are not that all part of the kind of the Celtic. Well, Celtic is a is a weird it's, yeah, thing. Yeah, it's a weird. It's, it's um, it's more a language group than a right. than a, than a people than group? a people. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So. Um, so that's why there could be druids in all these different places. Correct. But they might not necessarily be Celtic. Correct. And they might and, not even be druids in the same way. Right. They and they may not types. have been called a druid. They right. may have been called a shaman. Or mm-hmm. they may have been right. called the, you know. Probably the, not a shaman guy, specifically. Not a shaman. But yeah, like right. a medicine man. Medicine or, man. Who knows? Yeah, whatever. Some, the guy some, down the street. Whatever the term was right. in the ancient yeah. time that we don't know anymore. Right. So. Right. Whatever the ancient Gauls were calling their spiritual holy, their holy technicians. Right. Yeah. Yeah. They're well, and it ones. wasn't just even holy people. I mean, druids were kind of like the the stopgap between everything. So kind of like they law were, bringers. Yeah. Too so as they, well, right? you know, they did judges. a lot of the yeah, yeah judges. judging of things. They did a lot of the spiritual stuff. They did a lot of telling you when it was time to do things. They and... sort of filled in the gaps in a tribal system between mm-hmm. tribe member mm-hmm. and tribe ruler. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. Remember, Dith just pointed out they're kind of like the druids were kind of like modern pagans in that way <laughs> that they were a large right group. Disparate. But you could not be call yourself a druid until you had spent at least in the Celtic lands of right. Ireland, Ireland, Scotland. Scotland. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you could not call yourself a druid until you had spent twenty years studying. Right, because. None of it was written down. So, so, awesome. so you had to go had to talk memorized. to a bunch of people for 20 right. years. And memorize it all yep. so mm-hmm. that you then knew what to, to do. And they had so. schools for that, right? Or or yeah. maybe mentors? Uh, yeah. Like you would they go had to schools. Like, column A, column B. Yeah. Column, a little yeah. of both. They had schools. Their schools just functioned differently than right. ours do. Right. Now, would the Druids have been considered like polytheist? 
then? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yep. I would say the majority of them. The majority, yeah, yeah. yeah. probably theists. Yeah. That's, that's what we're talking about. Right, exactly. I'm sure there were theism. outliers. Mm-hmm. But so it's possible to be a non-theistic druid within within the in, the, in the modern day. Yes. Within the yep. ADF. Okay. And we know it's possible to be a non-theistic witch, because mm-hmm. Gwyn was one for a while. Yep. Yes. Yes, I was. I, I considered myself spiritual. But not religious. But not religious. And while I did acknowledge, you know, I had a patron goddess in Brigid, mm-hmm. um, I was, I considered myself, I was a secular witch. Right. Yeah, there was no worship of Brigid. There was yeah. no worship. It was more like partnership. Brigid was another <laughs> uh, spirit guy. Yeah. Or yeah, ally. essentially. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. You described your relationship t- to Brigid to me one time as, as as if she was your supervisor. Yeah, yeah. It, it was a lot like that. And I do believe that that, and that was a period of about two years. Mm-hmm. Two to three years. And that really was a, just an exhaustion of coming out of a monotheistic religion. Again. Again. <laughs> and I just didn't want to have anything to do with religion at all. Right. right. Not you even didn't if, want to worship anyone. I didn't want to worship anyone. I didn't want to have any to deal with any kind of religion, even on my own as a solitary. I just wanted to right. skip that portion altogether and just do witchcraft. But mm-hmm. I did the same thing. Like, mm-hmm. I spent two years of nothing. Mm-hmm. Right. Like, just complete which, disconnect. Which, you weren't at that time an atheist, per se. No, no. Or an agnostic. You were... I was, uh, I didn't give a fuck. Yeah, that's, there's, a, there is actually a term for that. It's called apathism. Yeah, okay. Which is a lack of interest in the divine, essentially. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think I didn't give a fuck would be a better term. <laughs> I was a. I didn't that's give a really, fuckism. That's they, not they, really how academia works. No, that's not, they, they would not put that in a in a textbook. I didn't no. give a fuckism. No. But <laughs> apathism on the end, it should work, apathism. right? But, but apathism, apathism. apathism. Yeah. Okay. And I think that comes from an exhaustion of religion, because ultimately, I think the thing. Or just have, a disinterest. Some a people disinterest. just aren't interested. Yeah, some people just aren't interested. But I, I know for me, it was kind of an exhaustion, and I, I think part of that comes from the fact that we have to remember religion from whatever angle it comes from, it is a man-made system. It is something people have created to to reach out to the divine if they happen to believe in a divine. Right. The the systems systems. of religion Mm -hmm. are, yeah, are constructed. They're constructed. And so are all these terms. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. We like to label ourselves so we can better understand where we're coming from. Is is how I think of it. Mm-hmm. And even though people get, you know, they get their noses bent out of shape at being put into a box, I found tend to put ourselves into these boxes. I found that when people complain about putting people into boxes, mm-hmm. they are mostly not complaining that they've been put into a box. Mm-hmm. They're mostly complaining that other people are creating boxes for themselves and they don't understand them. Mm-hmm. This is what I mostly find. I mostly find that when people go, why, 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 why does everyone have to have a label? now it's because they're like irritated at people around them Mm -hmm. finding identity labels Mm -hmm. and having to learn new vocabulary that they don't want to bother with and i think that's the thing to remember too is that you know we talked about this language changes terminology Mm -hmm. changes as people change and grow and Mm -hmm. and create different systems and different ideas about gods or not gods or whatever. And and periodically we make new words to describe these things. Exactly. To describe the details of the system. Because we have to understand one thing. Words is how we communicate. Mm -hmm. You know, we have to be able to understand one another and communicate these things if we're going to get along. And so we do have to be able to define for one another what we believe if it is an intrinsic part of who we feel we are. So I really like the term henotheism because I think it describes a very specific Mm -hmm. sort of spiritual and religious behavior, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But that's a 19th century word. Mm -hmm. It's very new in terms of language. Of language, yeah. Like uh, an ancient heathen, an ancient Norse person Mm -hmm. who believed in all the gods, but he was a farmer, so he only worshipped Thor on a day-to-day basis, wouldn't have described himself as a henotheist. But it's useful to me to describe that behavior as henotheism. That way you can understand better exactly. where that person was And I can from. better communicate that idea to other people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's, what... that's the whole point of words. Exactly. I was just going to say the exact same thing. That is the point of words. It's commercial time. Oh, God. You, that would be hilarious. No, absolutely <laughs> not. That, that is not becoming a jingle. 
All Meet right. a new friend at the Artful Egg. Our tiger Michelle invites you to her shop where she showcases her painted and carved sugar skull eggshells for the world to enjoy. Each piece is handcrafted and unique with a name and a style all its own and a desire to find a happy home with you. Every egg comes in a special box adorned with a note about the creation. Michelle has been sculpting her eggs since 2015 and knows that you and your family and friends will love it. She also makes natural eggs, beautifully painted rockery, and jewelry to share, as well as just sugar skulls. Michelle has been designing an acorn egg, which just happens to be one of the most popular eggs she makes. Adorned with lentils and wood beads and hemp or other leather hangings, visit The Artful Egg at theartfulegg.net. That's theartfulegg.net. But if you're in the market for something shiny, our Tiger Real would like to invite you to Relic Designs, spelled R-E-L-L-I-K Designs. Relic Designs produces wire wrap jewelry from amethyst points wrapped with coils of silver to bracelets of braided bronze and silver chain mail. Real works with all types of metals from copper to titanium and accepts custom commissions. You can find Relic Designs on Facebook at Relic Designs. That's R-E-L-L-I-K Designs, or on Instagram at relic.designs. There are a couple of imposter relic designs out there, so make sure you get the dots and the spacings right, and accept no substitutes. Heck yeah. That's right. Heck yeah. Heck yeah. Heck yeah. <laughs> Heck yeah. And we really wanted to encourage all of our listeners, you know, go check out these mm-hmm. businesses of our tigers. Of our tigers. Yes. Of our tigers. Because they have some our really, valiant tigers. Are really cool stuff to share with you guys. Because they're part of the pride. Yep. They are. They're part of the support pride. Support each other. So yes. Let's support one another. That's one of the things why we like to do this. Is yeah. Because we do want to support the pagan community. And we've got a lot of really talented, creative yeah. people in the pagan community. Yeah. And in the pride specifically. And in the yeah. pride. Yeah. Yep. My God, yes. Yep. We do. <laughs> the pride is wild. The pride is wild. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> And there's another t-shirt I'll write it design. down. I'll write the it down. The pride is wild. I'll write it down. <laughs> it's time for Old Stone Corner! Try not to make it block say, of mine, but I, still have the same yeah. intensity. We'll, we'll see. We'll see. I am going to be discussing Celestite. Celestite? Celestite. Interesting. Yeah. So this is a strontium sulfate crystal. It occurs mostly in compact, massive, and fibrous crystalline forms, and it can sometimes be found in geodes. In fact, the Crystal Cave in Ohio is a extremely large geode, essentially, that's been dug out, and it's now a tourist attraction, and it's full of celestite spars. Interesting. All the way through the cave. It was originally a much smaller opening of the geode, but the owner mined it out, because celestite, strontium sulfate, is used in manufacturing fireworks. Strontium sulfate is what makes the red color oh, wow. in, in fireworks. So it was mined out for a while. And then right before Prohibition, the owner who owned a winery in the area decided to uh, stop mining it to level out the floor and to make it into a tourist attraction so people could just come in and view all the crystals on the walls and the ceilings of this cave. Mm -hmm. And that was what allowed him to survive through Prohibition Gotcha. when he couldn't sell wine anymore. And now the winery and the Crystal Cave are both still open. For people to go and visit. For people to go visit, yeah. Oh, that's very cool. So if you're in Ohio, look up the Crystal Cave. It's full of uh, celestite. and then signs for the Crystal Cave. You know those big signs you see on barns? Uh No, that's for Rock City. (laughs) Go hit up the Crystal Cave and then go get some wine. Yeah, there you go. It sounds like a plan to me. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So celestite is mostly found in sedimentary rock alongside gypsum and rock salt. It's mostly found, it's it's fairly abundant, but it's mostly found in small individual quantities. Okay. Relatively small crystal formations uh, in sedimentary stone. And the most popular celestite is a pale blue color, and that comes mostly from Madagascar. But celestite in the white to clear range can be found throughout the world. Now, cool. is celestite something you would find in your local pagan store? Yes, you will probably find celestite around uh, in pagan stores and in, like, New Agey metaphysical stores. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of people like to say, you know, get some celestite, connect to your angel guides. (laughs) Ah. Celestite is composed of strontium sulfate, which I mentioned, and that's the the component in fireworks that gives you the red color. Strontium aluminate is... 
what makes glow-in-the-dark toys now. Oh, okay. Uh, it used to be a different chemical that was not as inert, but strontium aluminate is, like, non-toxic and completely harmless. So it's safe harmless. for children's toys. Yeah, and it actually has a stronger, longer-lasting glow in both green and blue. Oh, cool. So most uh, glow-in-the-dark toys now are made with strontium aluminate. Very cool. Sounds like a thing that you would have said in... Harry Potter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Cell state is a Mohs three to three point five, so you'll mostly soft. find it yeah, so it's soft. So you'll mostly find it in specimens instead of in gemstones or like cabochons. You're not gonna find celestite in jewelry mm, okay. by and large because it's very soft so it doesn't cut very well. Okay. And it is also heat and light sensitive. So if exposed to direct sunlight or heat lamps or things like that over long periods of time, the color will fade. So don't oh. keep it in your window. Yeah, don't do not do sun charging with your celestites. Right. Do moon a lot of charging. Exactly, do moon charging. A lot of people like to charge their stones in the sun. Um, they don't understand that sometimes your stones will f- lose their color and fade if exposed to light and heat over time. So really, so question, means- if you lose the color and it fades, does it lose its properties? I would say that when a stone fades like this, mm-hmm. my personal feeling is that the spirit in that stone essentially goes to sleep. Okay. And sort of like deactivates. Mm-hmm. Okay. If that makes sense. Yep. And so you would So encourage... it might still have some of its basic intrinsic properties, mm-hmm. but it's not going to be active in the same way that it was before. Gotcha. And so you would really encourage people, you know, before they cleanse their stones, right. find out what kind it is and if it should be cleansed in the sun right. or in the moon. Uh, and find out if it's okay for you to put it in salt or water. Mm-hmm. Some stones are water soluble. Celestite is not water soluble, so you can cleanse celestite in water if you so choose. Just don't leave it out in the sun afterwards. Right. Mm-hmm. The other thing that's interesting about celestite is so there are a class of protozoa <laughs> called radiolarians. Oh, okay. Radiolarians create skeletons for themselves out of minerals, mostly silica. But there is one radiolaria called acantharia, which creates celestine skeletons. They don't fossilize because there's very little sodium sulfate in seawater. So when they die, they just dissolve, Mm -hmm. unlike most radiolarians who are composed of silica. So they fossilize uh, and end up at the bottom of the seabed. And then ultimately your rock shell. Right. Acantharia does not fossilize because there's not enough composite mineral in the seawater for it for to, it to mineralize. mineralize. But but they create their skeleton out of this mineral and protozoa are single-celled organisms. The structure of these protozoa looks like a star. Oh. With with radial spines mm-hmm. and a and a central configuration. So they're ex- they're actually very very pretty mm-hmm. as single-celled organisms go. <laughs> <laughs> And I just, I, this is very interesting to me. It's very unusual. Radiolarians are the only, eukaryotes, the only single-celled organisms that create a skeleton for themselves out of surrounding minerals. Mm-hmm. And acantharia are the only radiolarians who create a skeleton with anything other than silica. And mm-hmm. what they use is celestite. Interesting. I gotta say, this is one of the, one of the most interesting oatstone corner for me because A, we got... A spell to do if we were in Harry Potter. Uh huh. Yes. <laughs> and radio Larians sound like a being from another planet. That's true. So. Fair. I would say that's it for oh No, it's not. No, it's not. No, I haven't talked oh. about the uses of celestite. Oh. Hurry up, hurry up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. So, celestite is actually not a very active stone. It's what I would call a room modifier. Mm -hmm. So, like, you leave it in a place and it just sort of radiates a vibe, but it's not very interactive. It's sort of gently optimistic, and it has what I call, uh, uh, ironically enough, star vibes, Mm -hmm. uh, referring to the star tarot card. So, hope, faith, general, like, good, uplifting positivity but in a very sort of mild way. Mm -hmm. And the other thing I would say is that celestite, and the reason I am talking about it today, is that celestite is what I would consider a good booster if you have a weak god phone or you're a fuzzy diviner. Mm -hmm. Um, If you have a hard time getting clear responses when you pray or when you work with the gods, or if your divination tends to be fuzzy and unclear, celestite will help you sort of just sort of gently boost 
the, uh, signal? the signal in in a room that it's in. Oh, so. very cool. Now and you now, can do it. That's it for Old Stone Corner. Ah, oh, you big <laughs> baby. <laughs> I guess it's time to talk about sort of what makes a god a god, or what distinguishes gods from spirits, from... Mm-hmm. Angels and demons from ancestors, you know. Good God, that's what, a whole what makes co- something, college course right, right there. What makes something divine, let's say. So let's mm-hmm. go around the table and just see sort of what everybody's Opinions. sort of gut check is on that. Let's start with Carr. Fucking <laughs> 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 boss, where did you come from? <laughs> Oh my goodness. <laughs> and this is actually a topic that I think we'll sort of continue to discuss yeah. as we do these six episodes. Exactly. But it's something I want to start sort of start getting into here. Gosh, I don't know. Divinity for me has been somewhat ascribed to me. Okay. Mm-hmm. In that people have told you what the divine is. Right. So people have said, you know, because I came out of Christianity. Mm-hmm. Right. Here, this mm-hmm. is the this God. Is this is believe. the one true God. Blah, right. blah, 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 blah. Then, you know, when I got out of that, mm-hmm. I didn't care. You're right. You had, had a period of apathism. I had a period of I don't give a fuckism. <laughs> And um, I'm gonna just make let him it. Have a, it. I'm gonna make it a word. Just, I'm not gonna let him, him have it. Let him have it. <laughs> no, I don't give a fuck. Ism is hostile. Apathism <laughs> is academic. <laughs> Coming into like trying to find what fit for me mm-hmm. because I'm Irish by heritage. Mm-hmm. I'd always been interested in Celtic. At that point, that's Christianity, true. right? Yep. And seeing how they did it, and they were very so Celtic Christians, in particular, uh, the group that I looked into were known as the Desert Fathers, and so they were different than normal Christians. Okay, they tell had, me about the Desert Fathers because they got a boss ass name. <laughs> they were early Christian hermits, ascetics, and monks, mm-hmm. and they lived in Egypt and in deserts. Deserts, <laughs> yeah, but the, their belief system was very different than like they were very mystical okay. in their traditions. That's what drew you to them? Yeah, and I think that's what drew me to them when I was still in Christianity and you know, they also believed in charity and forgiveness mm-hmm. and So they emphasized sort right. of the positive qualities so, of okay. Christianity. So, yeah. so you were and added a them. mystical element. Correct. So when you went into Druidry, mm-hmm. what uh, how did you interpret Well, so the I, gods took, from I took I took I I took that Celtic thing that I'd already always right. been interested mm-hmm. in because of heritage and started looking for, well, what kind of fits, you know, that. Because right. I, I definitely have an interest in my my heritage, ancestors, right. all right. that kind of stuff. Mm. I mean, so I started doing research on that, and that's when I found Druidry. And I really, at this point, only really have one or two, mm-hmm. depending on the day, gods out of the whole pantheon mm-hmm. that I think about. And who who are those? So that would be the Dagda, Uh who is, quote unquote, the all father of the Celtic pantheon. The big daddy. Yep. And Danu, who is oddly enough the Dagda's mother. The big mama. Isn't she a river? Uh, Yes, the Danube um, is a river. And the thought process is that the group that started the Indo European. We'll call it Pi, because mm-hmm. it's Proto-Indo-European, Proto-Indo-European. Started in that area around the mm-hmm. Danube. Okay. And that's why... So, But the Tuatha Danadan is the people who worship Danu. Yeah. Okay. So, Hence the name. Hence, hence the, the name, name, right. And so and the Dagda was the top of that. Okay. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of where I've fallen. I think some of the other gods are really cool, and I like their stuff, but right. it's not pe- not anyone that I think about on a constant basis. Now, when you think of the Dagda and Danu, mm-hmm. we're as because the question was, well, how do you define divinity? Right, what makes this? So what, what makes, makes them, them divine, divine as opposed as opposed to, to just big spirits? Somebody told me they were. It, it really, it really <laughs> has mm-hmm. come down to that. Is because even in Christianity, I never had like what I would call a quote unquote spiritual uh, experience. Sp- no, I had a lot of spiritual experiences, but they were all shitty. I mean, they were all like, you know, mountaintop experiences that you come back from youth camp and you feel great. And like <laughs> a week later, you're like, fuck. But no, I never had a, like a conversation with God. Right. Right. Or Jesus or whatever. And I really don't have that now either. Mm-hmm. So, you know, if it's. So if you it's, sort of feel like nothing's changed. Well, no, no, no. I definitely feel like a lot's changed because, I mean, I never would have done divination in Christianity. I never would have... I didn't even really let, like, 
essential oils around and that kind of stuff mm-hmm. because I thought they were weird and, and out there. You know, so I think a lot's changed in who I am and what I believe and but the only reason why I know about these gods that are out there right, is that other people, is that other people them. have worshipped them and have told me about them mm-hmm. through books and mm-hmm. online and that legit. kind of stuff. I mean, that's a, that's yeah, a that's legitimate, legitimate way to come to an right. understanding of what makes the divine. Yeah. To right. experience the divine. Now, I know a lot of the Celtic gods, but only two of them do I feel connected with. Mm-hmm. Right. So the Dagda... I think I feel connected with because I kind of feel like he and I are almost the same person. A little goofy. Um, big daddy. B- yeah, big daddy. You know, <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to wear my skirt up so you can see my butt walking around. But but he, you think it's funny. <laughs> but I think it's funny that he did. There's parts of him that I relate to very, right. very well. Mm-hmm. That right. resonate with you. Right, that resonate with me. Danu is more like... It's a... Big mom. Yes and no. It, it's it's kind of a different... A, a, when I first started, it was just the Dagda. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, I yeah, thought, you came to Danu yeah. sort of afterwards. Right, yep. It was a, oh, well, if all of these other gods in the Celtic pantheon, or in the Irish pantheon, I'll mm-hmm. call it. Yeah, specifically. Yes, yeah, yeah, specifically. Came from Danu, who mm-hmm. is, would not be Irish, right? Right, yeah. From the Danube. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Then, then that's the starting so, place So is it. Danu so, sort of the wellspring? I yep. guess of of divinity in, in Irish. I guess you could call it that. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yep. Mm-hmm. So um, my understanding. My relationship with her is significantly different than my relationship with the Dagda, just because I, I don't. I feel some distance there. Right. You know, I don't feel a connection point like I do with the Dagda. Right. Mm-hmm. So, but what makes them divine? Somebody told me they were. That's fair. That's and fair. And I accepted it. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, yeah that's fair. Yeah. That, so, you'll get no argument. I'm purely just asking what your gut reaction is. On yeah. This. Thanks for. Whoa, you're, welcome. <laughs> <laughs> you're welcome. All right, Gwen, your turn. Okay. Um, I think to start with, it was yeah. definitely, <laughs> it was definitely a same kind of thing. You know, I was taken to church as a very young child. Um, and told this is who God is. But I think I did have, because I was a very spiritual child, and I, I'm a spiritually sensitive person and mm-hmm. a psychic medium, and, and so I'm right, right. kind of intuitive that way. I had a sense that God was bigger than me, but this divine spirit existed. You know, it just, I don't know, it just clicked with me. I, I don't know that I could put it into words. Mm-hmm. I just understood, even if I, you know, even if I didn't know who God was or Jesus or the Holy Spirit or whatever, I understood that there there was a consciousness mm-hmm. there that I could connect to and relate to in some way. And I think that is how I still feel about uh, divinity, is that it is a separate consciousness for me. It is bigger than me. And because now I've become a polytheist, I think there's a lot of these mm-hmm. individuals out there. Yeah, I, th- I think that's the, the only way I can describe it, is that there's a spiritual, emotional connection an intellectual connection because you know I have meditative conversations with right. the with the gods and goddesses that I've connected to and I have since I was a small child mm-hmm. whether it was the Christian god or the goddesses with whom I work now so I, I think and spirit guides and and what uh, what distinguishes for you mm-hmm. uh, a spirit guide versus a divine being for me the feeling of a divine being is just bigger, more powerful, more, you know, than my spirit guide. My spirit guides feel like beings who have lived a human life at some point, Mm -hmm. or even if they, I think actually one of them hasn't, but, but that there's just a, there's not the bigness in their, in how they present themselves to me, in the feeling that I get from them and the interaction I get with them, with Brigid, with Hecate, with, um, you know, when I, went to a, a ritual for Apollo, mm-hmm. they just feel bigger okay. and more. there's more power there than I have when I'm working with, whether it is a spirit guide or um, a human being that's crossed over. They have a, they have a, different, a different kind feeling. of energy, a different kind of feeling, or um, what one might call um, an angel or a demon, depending mm-hmm. on your, 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 perspective. your perspective. But yeah, I think it, for me as an individual, it comes down to how I, how I feel the connectivity and interaction with them. Okay. So I actually have two answers to this. I have an answer that's a little more academic, and I have an answer that's a little more esoteric. Mm -hmm. The academic answer for what distinguishes a divine being versus any other spirit for me Mm -hmm. 
is that a divine being is one that you have a worshipful attitude towards, mm -hmm. right? Divinity is defined by the worship of the being rather than by an innate quality of the being. Mm -hmm. The more esoteric answer that I have is that I agree that gods feel very big, mm -hmm. but they are not the only bignesses I have felt. True. So what clarifies a god to me is not the raw intensity of that presence. Mm -hmm. It's the accessibility of that level of intensity. So... Mm -hmm. Like, I have perceived, I've described this before in the past, um, like, I've perceived the small spirit of a computer, mm -hmm. and through that spirit, I've perceived the larger spirit of, like, the electrical grid. Mm -hmm. And through that larger spirit, I've perceived the much, much larger spirit of, like, plasma as a concept. Mm -hmm. And plasma as a concept is an extraordinarily large spirit, mm -hmm. bigger in scope and intensity than any gods I've ever, you know, directly, personally experienced. Mm -hmm. However, the spirit of plasma as a concept is both very extraordinarily large and also very extraordinarily alien, mm -hmm. very extraordinarily inaccessible. I know it's there, but I couldn't talk to it. We are on completely different planes. Mm -hmm. There is no universe in which I, my spirit, and the spirit of the concept of plasma could have a coherent conversation mm -hmm. under any circumstances. Mm -hmm. So that to me, that spirit, though extremely large and powerful, is not divine. Mm -hmm. Because I could never, ever have any kind of interaction with it. Mm -hmm. But a divine spirit, like the gods that I worship, mm -hmm. I can, under the right conditions, have an interaction with, have a conversation with. They can work through me, mm -hmm. and I can work with them mm -hmm. to accomplish something. Mm -hmm. They may be very, very large... They may even be very, very alien on a different fundamental level than I am. Mm -hmm. But they are able to, or willing to, factor themselves down mm -hmm. in a way that I can communicate with, interact with, and engage on a personal level. Mm -hmm. In a way that, even though that the spirit of the concept of plasma is extremely large and powerful, mm -hmm. I have no access to that. Right. I do have access, or potential access, to the gods I worship. Mm -hmm. So, for me, what makes them gods, instead of just very big spirits, is their accessibility. That makes sense. That okay. makes sense. So, here's a question for you. Okay. With everything you just explained, mm -hmm. could an ancestor mm -hmm. become a god for yes. you? Yes. Yes. That is apotheosis. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> a, an ancestor, and this is especially true in heathenry, right? So... Heathenry, and we'll get into this more we'll in future episodes, but heathenry has a very sort of loose relationship between the differences between ancestor spirits and gods. Right. They're very fluid and flexible. Right. So for me, it's, it's entirely possible for one of the honored dead who is very well loved and who becomes very powerful in life mm -hmm. and very powerful in death to whom I have access could essentially apotheosize into, into a it. divine dead. Right. right. And anything could do that then. Right, right, yes. Right. So it wouldn't have to be a person necessarily, but mm -hmm. even... No, yeah. Uh, uh, if a great old tree dies... Right. And isn't that uh, a, a druidic yes. principle? Mm -hmm. yep. if, a great old, if a great old tree died and became purely a spiritual force mm -hmm. and was willing to work with and interact with and be accessible to me and wanted to be worshipped, that tree would become to me a god. Right. Right. For me, a god is a, a powerful spirit to whom I have access and to whom I owe worship. Right. I would also say, for me, you know, hearing that, that explanation of how mm -hmm. you see divine and the plasma and that right. kind of thing. For me, as a green witch, the, the earth is earth mother. Mm -hmm. And so there is an energy with which I connect to the earth as a, a kind of a divine force. 
not the same concept as I do the goddesses with with whom I work, mm-hmm. but but as a divine force and energy of a living being, mm-hmm. right? And then the trees, the plants, the rocks, all these other little spirits, they all have little energies and spirits themselves mm-hmm. that we, you know, that we connect to, that we understand. But for me, they're all ultimately draw their energy from the larger earth mother, if you will. Now, I don't know that I could connect directly to the earth mother, but I can, I can connect to her through a tree, a tree or a plant or a, or a, plant or a stone or so, some would you other call, part of nature. Would you call the tree spirits then faces of the earth mother in a soft polytheist kind of way? Potentially, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So I've noticed though that when you're talking about quote unquote deities that you work with, mm-hmm. You say that you work with. Yeah, you do not still say work. I don't. I, I guess I really still don't. I don't. So, yeah. So that being the case, do you worship the earth or Gaia? Or do you just work with? Or do mm-hmm. you just work with? I would have to say, as I'm sitting here thinking about it, trying to, you know, because it's true. I, I don't worship the mm-hmm. deities that I work with. Right. I would even say, when you even when you offer them, even when I'm you know, offering, regular, reg, you know, exact petitions and mm-hmm. and uh, I honor them, right? But you don't worship. But I don't, don't worship, worship them. them. I would say the Earth Mother is probably who, not Gaia, who is not a specific Gaia, god, right, a specific right, god, right. But the Earth Mother gotcha. is who. So because your with. Earth Mother is different from my yes. Emir Nerthus yeah. and Yorg, and the Earth Mother, as I understand her, is. Probably just my own concept mm-hmm. of, of of the planet of the planet <laughs> and and nature, you know, because it's not specifically Gaia. Now, would I use a Gaia statue to to represent to represent the Earth Mother? Absolutely. But when I'm speaking of the Earth Mother, I'm not speaking of Gaia directly. I'm right. speaking of a completely different. You're speaking of a concept. I'm speaking yeah, of in the, that same archetypal way that some Wiccans do talk about the Lord and Lady. Yes. For me, that's the Earth Mother, so and it, which encompasses nature and the planet. Interesting. Right. Now we did have some questions, I think. Oh, good grief! I have. It's been yeah. The Discord's been me. very, very busy. Yeah. Very busy. I think somebody was asking if the honored dead get angry if we don't uh, venerate them. Oh, do they get mad at us for not acknowledging them? No, I don't think so. It's going to vary depending on the dead in particular, I would imagine. I imagine there are some dead who have stronger feelings about this than others. By and large, unless it's your specific dead, unless there's a specific dead person in your like family tree... Right. Who's been reaching out for worship? I don't think you're going to find too many of the honored dead who are like frustrated that they're not getting their dues. Right. You know, they're busy doing their own shit. Mm-hmm. I think one of the things that, and the reason why I asked, uh, owed the question about an ancestor then becoming mm-hmm. divine is that, in particularly in the Irish Celtic mythos, there are many very gods that are big, but mm-hmm. they're very concentrated in one area. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, and so, and so I wonder if that's kind of where they came from. Right. Is... I think, and I think, uh, wasn't Bran the Blessed? Uh, originally a mortal. Yes. Yeah. Who who became, who became a god? A god. Yep. Yeah. Akaneko has some interesting information to share about... Academically speaking, I feel like something qualifies as a divine god if more than one person worships them in the same manner. Like ancestor shrines, worship, and spirit guides are not necessarily divine, but could become a family god if there are multiple people engaging in in a worshiping relationship for them. But I am open to the concept of autotheism, so I have a loose definition. Mm -hmm. Uh, Family gods are actually very interesting. There is... A concept in heathenry called the Hamingja. A Hamingja is a luck spirit, sort of divine, that is attached to a family. It's sometimes thought to have originally been a female member of the family who died, and rather than going to one of the many other options that happen when you die in heathenry, Uh, was attached to the family's luck and protects and supports the family's luck, influences the the family members, Mm -hmm. uh, protects them from outside spirits, and attempts to keep the the luck clean Mm -hmm. and to pay off old debts. Whether the Hamingja qualifies as a god or a spirit is, again, complicated because 
uh, heathenry doesn't care very much right. okay. about defining these things. And then Lorelei... They uh, created us, or however you believe, and would play with us as they would regardless of whether we acknowledge them, but it's in our power to acknowledge them for what they do, but we don't have to. As far and that as was gods. based on, yeah, a question that was asked earlier, did the gods create us or did we create them? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's a good question. You know. Right, and that's another thing that that's going to vary widely depending on your personal religious perspective. Yep. Mm-hmm. I have come to a place in my life where, uh, and I like to just sum this up with cognitive dissonance is a lie. Mm-hmm. A thing can be both true and untrue. Mm-hmm. I've come to a place where I can accept that we created the gods and they created us. Mm-hmm. That both of these things can be true in different ways. I think I would say I've, I've come to that kind of a, a concept as mm-hmm. well. I I do think some, you know, a force, you know, divinity, the gods, however, you know, how however a person chooses to define mm-hmm. it, created, and then we created them as well. Yes, I would agree with that. Mutual creation. Mutual creation, yeah. Or mutual non-creation. Mm-hmm. Because, again, we do have people who... You know, who don't believe in divinity and, mm-hmm. and don't believe in the And gods. non-theism, to be clear, although all of us here at the table are, <laughs> are theistic uh, of various kinds, no shade if you're non-theistic. Exactly. Like, right. You do you. Yeah. Exactly. I'm cool with it. Yeah. Exactly. I don't need anyone to believe what I believe. Right. You know, and Rana pointed out that the word worship is uncomfortable for them. It's uncomfortable for some people, mm-hmm. especially, I think, who come out of a Christian perspective. Yeah. Um, and I think that's why I don't worship the god the gods and goddesses that i work with i don't even know that i could necessarily say that i worship the earth mother it, it's, it's right you're it's uncomfortable un- with that. uncomfortable with the, the same way some people are uncomfortable with prayer yeah right the concept mm-hmm. of prayer yeah. mm-hmm. i'm comfortable with these things in part because i retain very little baggage from my very brief tenure in christianity mm-hmm. Yep. Mm-hmm. so for me these are just natural concepts like yes of course i worship my gods that's what they're there for and that's what i'm here for like Mm -hmm. that's the natural state of things Mm -hmm. and of course i pray to them because that's the easiest way to communicate with them to me prayer is just the word we use for communicating with the divine however you happen to do that for me worship is just a word that describes how i love honor respect and venerate the gods but now i think it's time for cars feast table cars feast table so in my f- looking for things that fit, because I always try to find something that kind of fits what we're talking about. Mm-hmm. It's really hard to find s- a something that matches that the abstract concept of theism. Yeah, <laughs> but I managed to do it, mm-hmm. kinda. So the Greek gods drank nectar and they ambrosia. ate ambrosia. Well, we have no idea what the fuck ambrosia is. Right, what, was. It's, what it's supposed to indicate, yeah. But in the late 1800s in the south of the United States of America, they came up with this fruit salad called ambrosia, so that's what we're going to do. <laughs> but it's from a much better source than what my mom used to make. Sorry, mom. <laughs> I don't think your mom listens, but. No. Um, God, I hope not. <laughs> so, this is actually Alton Brown's recipe from Good Eats. Ooh. So, mm-hmm. um, it's half a cup of heavy cream, one tablespoon of sugar, and four ounces of sour cream. Six ounces of homemade mini marshmallows, or approximately three cups. You can buy them. Uh huh. I was gonna say if you can't make your own marshmallows, store bought is fine, as and they say. I would say if you're gonna do that, I would buy the fruit flavored multicolor marshmallows oh. from from Lucky Charms. Well, they're kind of like Lucky Charms, but they're bigger. They're are they're puffed up. They are. No, I'm just gonna get puff. a Lucky Charms okay, and dig all the marshmallows. Okay, up. so sour cream. Yeah, <laughs> sour cream marshmallows. marshmallows. Uh, one cup of clementine orange segments, okay, which is about six clementines. One cup of chopped fresh pineapple, okay. One <laughs> cup of freshly grated coconut. One cup of toasted chopped pecans, okay. And half a cup of rinsed and dried maraschino cherries. Oh, why they gotta be rinsed though? They have a good. Mm-hmm. Well, the, the reason why you rinse them is because the heavy cream that you've whipped together to create standing peaks before you put the mm-hmm. sour cream in mm-hmm. it will turn pink if you don't rinse the maraschino what, cherries off. What if I want the... a pink whip? Well, then you can <laughs> you make it pink. So and... this was like a standard of 
my childhood. Mine too. Um, but like Rana, I'm swearing it had mayonnaise in it. The that my mom is that your made. mom made? Yes. Well, Alton yeah. Brown, gross. Alton Brown has declined it the was, mayonnaise. It was gross. Yes. Yeah, no mayonnaise in this. This is sour cream <laughs> and uh, heavy cream. And heavy that cream. That sounds yep. much yep. better. And a little bit of sugar. Yeah, it does so. sound much it better. Much I don't better. think I would be into a mayonnaise fruit salad either. But oh this God, sounds no. very good. Yeah. It does. It's, but it's Alton Brown, so of and course it is. When my mom made it, she just dumped a can of. You know, fruit salad in it. Um, yeah, fruit cocktail. Uh-huh. Right, fruit cocktail. <laughs> or a lot of the one, other ones I found that were not Alton Brown were like mandarin oranges out of the can. Oh, and no. cherries. See, I think and that's how my mom used can. to make it. And, you know, if you get enough of this, that shit out of aluminum uh-huh. cans, yeah. it just tastes like crap. Here you've got fresh fruit Heck yeah. with whipped, like, cream. whipped cream that you've that made you've yourself. Made, yeah. and can I ask, um, because Rana and I are both on the kind of the ew scale when it comes to including the sour cream. Could you make it with just the fresh whipped cream and not put the sour cream in it? You'd have to probably do more whipped cream, yes. I could do to that. Do that but I, I'd be okay with that. I think you need to try it with the sour cream. I want to try it with the sour cream, just in case. I think it'll actually, like, just conceptually, I think it'll complement the sort of tanginess of the pineapple. Yeah, of the other fruit. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. So. Okay. I think it would be good, actually. Yep. Okay. We'll, get, we'll give it a try. Mm-hmm. We'll see. Maybe I'll change my opinion about ambrosia. <laughs> yes. So there you go. Cars I came up it. with something that actually kind of somewhat fit. Well, well what done. are you going to do when we talk about the deities again? I'll find something else. Angel Just, food cake. <laughs> <laughs> Close enough. Nectar. Nectar. Nectar, oh, yeah. Says, nectar. Yeah, so do gonna, the nectar. I'm going to have to head, come up with a recipe for honey mead. That's easy. <laughs> yeah. Okay. There we go. All right. I think that's everything. The only other thing I wanted to talk about or mention during this episode, as opposed to, you know, saving things for future episodes, because like I said, we've got a couple of these planned, uh, is that it's normal and fine for you to sort of drift through these. Mm-hmm. Yeah. As you, you can don't, tell, I do. Yeah, you don't have to pick one and then be there forever. You're allowed to change your mind on and these change, subjects. Change and change the gods you work exactly, with. Exactly. Uh, or worship. Or worship. And it's, it's not a reflection on you, your character as a person. Mm-hmm. This is kind of a Western thing that has come down through some combination of Christianity and secularism, mm-hmm. uh, at, at least in America, uh, where we live where people seem to have developed this idea that if they ever changed their opinion that means they were wrong in the past and if they were wrong in the past that means they were bad in the past and since you can only ever be bad or good that means they must still be bad and that makes them extremely resistant to changing their opinions this is a false dichotomy it's bullshit yes (laughs) And that's the difference between us as people. <laughs> um, this is a false dichotomy. The, you, you are neither good nor bad. You are a complex person working through a process every day of your life. Today, you may be agnostic. Tomorrow, you may be a hard polytheist. God knows that's how it went for me. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, And I, will, well, I do want to say we really didn't touch very much on the non-theistic viewpoint. Well, none um, of us are non-theists. That's what I was currently. Say. It's hard for us to do that because we are not really non-theistic. Currently. Currently. Although I did spend a pretty good period as mm-hmm. uh, an agnostic. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I do want to say for those listeners out there who are non-theistic, that you know, don't let anybody pressure you into thinking yeah. or feeling like there's anything wrong with your practice or your tradition mm-hmm. or your beliefs if you are non-theistic. Whatever, you know, variation the, that is. The only time that's going to matter is if in your tradition mm-hmm. it's a requirement to have a theistic belief. In which case, maybe a different tradition for you. Exactly, yep. <laughs> exactly. My, my whole thing is, you know, we, should, we do have a, a beautiful, diverse community. Mm-hmm. We should be allowed to uh, express and experience our paths and our traditions and our beliefs and our religions. Openly with, and freely. Openly yeah. and freely. And we not only should be... We are. Exactly. (laughs) Anyone who has an argument on that point, goodbye. Exactly. (laughs) Agreed. They say music is the universal language, and our tiger allure driver is ready to speak to you with the music of Aqua Girl. Aqua Girl is an indie pop musician with a very chill, listenable synth tone married to lyrics that are by turns hopeful and honest. All of Aqua Girl's tracks have their own charms, but Ode suggests gently a soft, focused meditation on the steadfastness of love. You can find Aqua Girl at aqua-girl.bandcamp.com. Gently, I will love you till I die. Slowly, we will change over time.
is Tiger Amanda, sneaking in just under the wire in time for this episode, comes bearing relaxation and self-care in the form of handmade artisan salts of Wonderful Body Co. These soaks and scrubs inspired by popular books and characters and designed to delight multiple senses with fragrant scents and sparkling mica. You can also find a small selection of rollerball fragrances. With a couple dozen options available, you're sure to find something you like at Wonderful Body Co. Collection. And since Ode writes these commercials and must represent house pride at every opportunity, the Slytherin Bath Salt gets a special shout-out, being spectacularly green with notes of bergamot black tea. Find Wonderful Body Co. online at wonderfulbodyco.com or go directly to the shop at etsy.com forward slash shop forward slash wonderful body co and if y'all want to represent your own houses you're gonna to have to write the commercials your damn selves <laughs> i am a slytherin i represent slytherin whenever the option is there i wasn't worried about the house i was thinking about the wonderful lavender the body. lavender buttercream yes that's very God. nice yes. yes but listen i, I gotta i gotta rep my house but i gotta rep the lavender buttercream i gotta rep my house house lavender pride butter house cream. pride <laughs> lavender buttercream i'm just saying all right so um if any of you all want to write some of these commercials <laughs> some of our listeners uh, feel free to send those to car at three pagans and a cat dot com and we'll take care of it from there. Um, if you and again, we say support our right, support the pride, support the pride. I, all these commercials we do uh, are they're provided to us by our tigers. They are yep. members of the pride. They are they're, members of the they pride. are among you. Yes, they are among you. So check out their wares and support them. Mm-hmm. Yep. All right, I'm gonna stop the podcast then. Okay, okay right. we're done. You've been listening to Three Pagans and a Cat. Find out more information at www.threepagansandacat.com.